This is the lecture for European history for Tuesday, March the 2nd, uh, 2021. Uh, you all should have your notes out at home and make sure that you also signed in at home. Where we left things was with the United States having achieved transcontinental status by expanding westward from the eastern seaboard to uh, go as far as the Pacific Ocean. And these expansions came at the expense of the native peoples that were here. Um, they are not by any means the only people in the world to have been conquered in history. It happens. It's just one of those things. But what was particularly nasty about this conquest was that it wasn't simply a clean case of being defeated in war again and again. What happened was there were negotiations in good faith, which didn't turn out to be in good faith uh, for both sides. And the shenanigans, for lack of a better word, that were played by the American government uh, are something that I am not proud of. Would I undo it? Because there's a lot of cultural masochism associated with these events. <clears throat> there are a lot of modern people who benefit from the existence of the United States who talk about how much better the world would have been had Columbus not discovered America or had the natives not been conquered. And rather than mere sentimentality, which a lot of these <clears throat> arguments involve, let's ask or let's consider the situation rationally. Is there such a thing as a nature preserve among civilizations? Is there such a thing as a place where people from advanced countries will not expand into out of some hope that we wouldn't disturb the natural and ecosystem, cultural or uh, ecological? Well, if there is, I've never heard one. Yeah. There is one like that savage island that I was talking to you about. It's off the coast of India. I forget the actual name. Trust me, if they had found oil there, the British would have gone in with guns, and those people would have been, been dealt with. That was left, yes. Uh, the jungles of the Brazilian rainforest and of Papua New Guinea and of Central Africa are also places that are so thick and not well traveled by outsiders that it's possible that there are still tribes there that haven't been known. Uh, as to the Inuits, the Eskimo peoples of the northern uh, polar region, uh, some of those tribes hadn't been conquered until around 1900. So there are places where people don't happen to go. That's not the same thing as a, a zone where all developed nations say we will not interfere. Yes? Um, I think, like going back to the question, I think that in theory people want to think that like with what happened with like the rainforest, or what's it called again? The one in <clears throat> South America. Uh, yeah, the Brazilian uh, yeah, that, Amazon rainforest. Yeah, Amazon. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, like people like to think that oh, it's so precious and all this, we won't touch it. But as soon as there's benefits with like um, deforestation and stuff like that, as soon as uh, benefits arise, then they kind of lose all sense of like moral, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that people want to think. That there are untouched places like that until we can find benefits to help us. Indeed. And that, that that's the case I was making regarding that island. If you have a place that has nothing anyone outside wants, it may have a history like Ethiopia, which is not a place that has been conquered <clears throat> by foreigners except for a brief five-year period of Italian rule uh, just before and into World War II. Why? It's mountainous, it's remote, it's desert, there's nothing there except the source of the Blue Nile, 
And since the kingdoms that were conquering were Christian, the fact that the oldest Christian church in the world happens to be in Ethiopia made them more reluctant to go in than they might have. But had they found something, oh gosh, yes. And the Italians still went in. And they went in for a sense of national pride. <coughs> they wanted more land for Italy, and this is under Mussolini, of course. Uh, and they also wanted to uh, avenge a defeat at the Battle of Adawa in the 1890s, where the Ethiopians actually drove them out successfully. The, the Aitais didn't come back for uh, about 30 years. So, in fact, today, and for, for my entire lifetime, the best nature shows uh, for land creatures, in my opinion, were all about the Serengeti Plain. Presumably you know what the Serengeti Plain is because you're educated people. But if you don't, it's in East Africa. It's in Tanzania and Kenya, and it basically parallels the Rift Canyon, and it's in the regions of Lake Kilimanjaro, uh, Lake, Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya. And it is a beautiful nature preserve that the British set up and that the Kenyans and Tanzanians, to an extent, have tried to maintain. However, both Kenya and Tanzania are third world countries with genuine poverty. And in cases where you have countries with ballooning populations, very limited resources, very limited money, if they can make money off of tourism to the Serengeti, which, which is what a lot of ecologists and ecologically minded Westerners want them to do, then great. Uh, they'll make money with people going on safari without shooting the animals, you know, photographic safaris. Which, by the way, if you ever get a chance to do, I hope you do. Uh, seeing lions in the wild, seeing elephants and giraffes in the wild, hyenas and wild dogs in the wild, gazelles and water, wildebeests in the wild, all that stuff. I, I, I mean, I can't imagine how wonderful that would be. But is that enough for the ballooning population of poor people in these countries? Is it enough if you are a person who has a family depending upon you, mouths to feed, and you know what those elephants are? On top of being wonderful creatures and mammals with bigger brains than we have, they're ivory on the hoof. And the thing about ivory, the thing you really need to understand, is that no matter how many laws are passed, people will buy ivory with lots of money. And if you become a poacher, and you are able to successfully bribe the camp, the, the park rangers or, or, or drive them off with weaponry, uh, you can make a lot of money trading ivory. And the same thing is true for a variety of other things. You get wealthy, unscrupulous people around the world, particularly in East Asia, who would love to have a captive tiger because they're manly. Uh, or a Chinese homeopathic medicine. Rhino horn makes men manly. So uh, if you take uh, basically uh, powdered rhino horn pills, any difficulty that you're having in the loving department will be solved, according to Chinese homeopathic medicine. They also put a lot of ginger in, so it's you know burnt. Um, so I've been told I've never taken the rhino horn. But when you have people believe this stuff and are willing to pay for it, um, or are willing to capture tigers. And, you know, you have a mansion uh, somewhere in the east, and they say, oh, come, look at my tiger. And you've got this tiger, you know, ranging it around in a space the size of this classroom. That's not enough for an adult tiger. Not really, especially if it's all a concrete, you know, cage. But people will do that. They'll steal a tiger cub and let the, the buyer raise the tiger. So what happens to the Serengeti? It's not pure. It can't be. There are too many needy people around it who can see lots of opportunities to grab cash. It's as clean and pure and protected as it can be under, under the circumstances. If Europeans had not gone into the Americas, do you honestly, in Columbus's time, can any of you honestly say that if China 
had gone expansionist, or if Europe had discovered the Americas a hundred years later, um, or if Arab traders had discovered the Americas during the time of the Islamic expansion, or if the Mongols had gone up into eastern Siberia and crossed over the Bering Sea, that the primitive peoples of North and South America would not have suffered the same fate of being overcome. Because of the oceans, because of the geography of the world, human beings came to the Americas about 10,000 years ago during the Ice Age. And in that time, humans spread from uh, Point Barrow, Alaska, down to Tierra del Fuego, south of South America. <coughs> but these humans did not go through the same historical processes that shaped civilization in Eurasia, particularly in North Africa. The Darwinian struggles for survival between Sumerians and Akkadians and Babylonians and Egyptians and Jews and Hittites and Hyksos and Persians and Medes and Greeks and Indian empires and Chinese empires and Japanese empires and the steppe horsemen like the Huns or the Mongols or the Manchus, the Magyars, the Bulgars, in Europe, the Germans and the French, the Romans and the Spaniards, the English and the Scandinavians. All of that history, which you should have had at least a brief picture of when I mentioned the names, you should be able to at least picture something about them. All of that history creates a struggle for survival that absolutely punishes primitives. Absolutely, without a doubt. Sub-Saharan Africa is spared and the jungles of Southeast Asia to an extent are spared because of malaria and because of the geography being just so difficult to get to. And most of the time, the geography is behind a desert like the Sahara bar barrier in Northern Africa or a mountain barrier like the Himalayas. The Americas didn't have that same intense struggle for survival. As such, the developments were very languid, very relaxed. The most advanced American societies that we know of in pre-Columbian times were the Mayas, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mound Builders, the Olmecs, all of whom are at about the cultural and technological level of the ancient Babylonians in Hammurabi's time, or maybe, maybe in Nebuchadnezzar's time. The theoretical math, the intense observations of the heavens, the development of calendars as a high-tech thing, all of that is typical of Mesopotamian and early Egyptian and early Indian and early Chinese cultural levels. And that's the most advanced. For the rest, you've got some Paleolithic, uh, some Neolithic societies like in the American Southwest, the corn-growing peoples of the Pueblo, the Anasazi, the Hopi, and so forth. And then you've got Paleolithic hunter-gatherers of various types in North and South America. There is no way, no historical scenario that I can imagine where from the period of from 1492 to the present, the people of the Americas, thousands of years behind those people of Eurasia, could have preserved themselves in the face of foreign contact. I can't imagine it. Maybe you can. Maybe it's a failure of my imagination to see. Uh, I know for certain... There's, like, well, basically, um, I guess I'm a little confused on what you say about, like, themselves. Because I know that the Aztecs were basically going on, like, like a giant conquering spree right before Columbus arrived. Yeah. And right before the Spaniards basically toppled the entire empire. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
theoretically, if the Europeans never showed up and the Aztecs did conquer all the way from Argentina to... Yeah, Alaska. it's unlikely. First of all, the Incas were probably more able than the Aztecs to, to certainly defend themselves. I can't imagine the Aztecs moving through the Panamanian jungles successfully down into the Inca region. But I see what you're saying. I think that what you would see is that there are natural limits of geography to what the Aztecs would be able to do, and culture. Um, the biggest pre-industrial empires tend to be very short-lived. The Mongols, the unified Islamic conquests of the uh, early Umayyad Caliphate, uh, and then they break up. And some of them remain competitive and some of them fall behind. And the ones that fall behind either are left aside or they're absorbed or whatever. Um, those that are stable, I think the biggest ancient empires that were stable are China, Rome, Persia. All three of those empires controlled a large area with many cultures in them, and they lasted several hundreds year, or thousands of years, in the case of China. Um, but they all found natural limits. Had the Aztecs continued to expand, they might have gotten as far as the American desert southwest. They might have gotten as far as absorbing the Hopi and the Pueblo and, and that sort of thing, in what is now New Mexico and Arizona and maybe even Southern California. I can't imagine a scenario where they would go into the wetter and cooler terrain uh, of the American South, the East, the, the Southern Confederacy, old states. Uh, I can't imagine them going and getting as far as here in, in Northern Idaho. Um, I th and I, I, it's because I don't think that their human sacrificing theocentric society would be capable of, of maintaining an empire that large. Still, you raise a point. Those people who feel terribly, terribly guilty about some things that they never did, like slavery or like the uh, conquest of the Indian nations, assume that there was an alternative. What you just brought up is the possibility that you didn't even need transcontinental travel to bring conquest. Had the Aztecs expanded, had the Incas expanded beyond their geographical region in the high Andes, they might have provoked the development of other civilizations in response to them. But you still would have been starting two or three thousand years behind Eurasia. And the likelihood is that the intensity of the competition between the American societies would have been lower because there were simply fewer of them. In Eurasia, you've got people coming from all over the place, either in raids and in, in, in wars or in folk wanderings. Um, eventually, my, my argument is, somebody would have conquered these primitive peoples. Not because they're bad people, because they're not. Not because their cultures are unworthy, because they are. But because human beings are not nice. When we encounter weakness, we take advantage of it. If you're on the street and somebody shoves you into a building as they're walking by, and they look like a linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers, <laughs> Are you going to mouth off to them? You might, but many people would think twice about it. They may be in a roid rage moment. They may have just lost their puppy. You don't know what's going on with them. But even if you said, hey, what the hell? You'd be ready for something serious because mountain of muscle meat, angry, looking at you. Now, if the same thing happened, but it was a string bean, stereotypical nerd geek who is 100 pounds soaking wet, six and a half feet tall, completely thin, and glasses, and the buck teeth, and the pocket protector, and a slide rule, because they're an old-fashioned nerd geek, and all that stuff, would you mouth off? Would you say, hey, what the hell? You might not. Uh, okay, you can do that too. 
we have a built-in sense of self-preservation. And we also have a built-in sense of opportunism. Weakness invites attack. It does. And through no fault of their own, the peoples of North and South America were weak because they were technologically backward. Not because there's anything wrong with them, not because there's any intellectual retardation, none of that, for the simple reason that they were not in the hyper-intense Darwinian struggle of the countries between the British Isles and the Japanese archipelago. That region of the world, the basically subtropical region of uh, and temperate region of uh, the Northern Hemisphere is where civilizations are born and they basically refine one another by conflict and by cooperation also. So with respect to the modern tendency to politicize absolutely everything, I recommend that you not accept guilt for stuff you never did. I don't think any of you, in a moment, I don't think any of you ever owned a slave. I don't think any of you ever profited from owning a slave. And I don't think any of you run around being foaming at the mouth, Ku Klux Klan style racists. And if you don't or have not done any of that stuff, maybe you want to give yourself a break when somebody looks at you and says, just because you're white, there's built in white privilege and uh, systemic racism. Maybe they're full of it. Maybe they're trying to sell you on guilt to give them power over you. Maybe they're trying to manipulate you. Maybe guilt by association, guilt by being a part of a group, is an immoral and illogical way to approach life. And if you personally did not see another person's land, take some guns and either drive them off of it or turn them into slaves on it, Maybe you want to cut yourself some slack the next time somebody tells you that you are guilty of things that happened hundreds of years ago. Maybe you will find in your own lives enough to feel guilty about from your own damn choices. Just maybe. There are people waiting to get their hooks into you. Because you're nice people because you're relatively innocent. And because if they can make you feel guilty, they have power over you. They can use you and they will benefit. And it's a horrible thing. Please consider protecting yourself from these predators. Yes. Second point, uh, second like kind of alternate reality. Sure. Vikings, Leif Erikson. Yeah. They don't really conquer anyone unless they have something worth taking. Exactly. So if they came over, they wanted. Well, they did to... come over. Yeah, they did. But like, they, if they went farther, they ah. didn't go very far. Well, no, they didn't. And what happened is that what the Vikings were looking for primarily was land. Yeah. Uh, the reason there were so many raids on Europe, a, is because Europe was weak and rich, and the Vikings were poor and hungry for wealth. But they were really hungry for land. You have a population explosion thanks to a global warming trend in the eight and nine hundreds AD that causes a population explosion in areas that do not have much land. They have a finite amount of farmland in these fjords and even in Sweden, in the open country of Sweden. So what you do is... Okay. You look for land in Iceland. You look for land in Greenland and you look for land in Vinland. The problem with Vinland is it's so far away from the Scandinavian homeland, number one. Number two, all they find is land. So the people who want to be farmers go there. Problem is Skrelings. Skrelings are Native Americans who fight and ultimately drive the Vikings out. Not because the Vikings are weaklings. They're not. I mean, they're, you know what Vikings are. I mean, you're a Norwegian. Mm. The, the problem is, um, your sister always told me that she was Norwegian. She was very proud of that. That's, yeah, I, that's I, the only reason I know. Yeah, it's not very far. It's not actually as distant as you think. No, no, I know it's not. <laughs> I know. I've, I've known Scandinavians in my life. 
Uh, the the point is, um, the Indian, with the tech level the Vikings had, the Vikings had steel weapons, and if they thought to bring horses, which I don't think they did, uh, to Vinland, or except maybe, no, they didn't, because the Indians didn't get them. There's no question in my mind that if the Vikings brought horses, the Indians uh, would have taken them and used them, and you would have a horse culture in North America, which didn't exist until the Spaniards came. Um... But is, what is your point? I'm trying. I'm trying to suss out your point. I think I'm answering, deflecting, rather than answering directly. There really wasn't a point. You were just saying maybe there would be, um, like, okay. I'm just like yeah. trying to picture like different futures. Like if Columbus, like if the Vikings actually did win and they did conquer, it, how the outcome would be different mm -hmm. in comparison to how the Spaniards did it. Yes, how... and there would be a difference. The Spaniards had far more resources, and the Spaniards had Christianity. The Viking, the Viking pagans were not out to spread their religion. Uh, you know, they thought Thor was fine for them, but they didn't really care what their victims worshipped. In fact, it was better for their victims to be Christian because they were more peaceful. Uh, and when the when the Scandinavians became Christians, they became more peaceful. There's a reason why being a Christian is a requirement for becoming a part of Western civilization. The point is that the presupposition of people who try to employ guilt-ridden politics in today's controversies is fundamentally false. There is no way that two continents, rich and primitive, were going to be left alone once the Eurasians' main powers knew about them. None. And even if they had been left alone, there would have still been predatory cultures from Central America. I think mainly uh, what people are getting at is how they weren't left alone rather than them not being left alone at all. Well, we could have treated them the way the Mongols treated their conquered peoples. We didn't. Uh, we could have treated them the way the Russians treated... There are analogies between the Russian drive eastward through Siberia the Canadian and the Canadian and Americans drive westward. And actually, if you look at Canadian history, that nice country, it did actually worse by their Indians than we did. That's, in a hell of, that's a hell of a charge, but look into it. Look at what the Canadians did on their route westward. What the Russians did is they sent fur trappers, and then they sent the army. And if anyone even looked funny at the Russians or didn't immediately adopt Russian ways, Russian language, uh, they were wiped out. Yeah. The Russians didn't mess around. So I, I get, and I have told you, I have led with the fact that I think that the American government was very unrighteous in these events. I agree with that. But the assumption that I'm trying to address is that there was an alternative. Could we have been more gentle, more honest, more honorable? Hell yes. But in the end, would we have allowed these countries the nations of the Iroquois, or the nations of the Sioux, or the nations of the Salish-speaking peoples, or any of them, to remain as independent countries in a world like the world that's, that's had the scramble for Africa. Yeah. It's the same very period of Western expansion. I'm not saying that there is... I, I, what I'm saying is, don't feel guilty for stuff you didn't do, and also consider the possibility that... What happened was bad, but it probably would have happened in some way, shape, or form alternately because of the technological difference. Think about it. Come to your own conclusions. Research it yourselves because it's worth thinking about. Do you have anything else? I'm not trying to shut you up. I'm trying to... Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a thought and then it disappeared. It happens. If it occurs again, you can raise your hands, and if I have time, we'll go into it. Don't it. Anyone else have any thoughts about this? Okay. So horrible. That's, um, that's me. I just, I know what's coming. I know where you're going. I know the campus cultures that you, mostly, or all of you, are going to end up on. And because of what you are, through no choice of your own, because of where you grew up, people will hook into you and they will try to manipulate you and use your decency against you. 
don't. I don't know. Okay. So if people are going to go as far as manipulating, emotionally manipulating an entire group of people, there's, I don't. Are you denying that this is happening? No, no, no. I'm okay. not denying that it's happening. I'm okay. just saying that there's probably got to be a pretty good reason for an entire. <laughs> of course there's a good reason. Power. Fair. You don't. <clears throat> Look. There's a reason why people went to the set Black Hills of South Dakota. Gold. They wanted to get rich so they wouldn't have to work hard anymore. <laughs> if people can convince you to uncritically accept their way of looking at the world, they've got you. You're a human resource. That's why. What you're saying is, I think what you're implying is, there must be a genuine justification for it or they wouldn't be doing it. Not necessarily a justification, just at least something that like you could look at and be like, oh, that makes sense. What I didn't say, maybe not, but I see why they're doing it. I see looking at history and learning from it so that we don't make the same lousy decisions that was made were made by others. I'm a history teacher. Of course I believe in that. What I don't believe in is the culture of white guilt, white shaming, and all of this other absolutely blatantly racist stuff that would not have flied 20 years ago because the culture would have looked at it and said, that's just racism. But somehow it has become normalized to talk about white people as if they are the modern whatever. That's not right. Racism of all kinds is wrong. And the justifications that people use. How about this for a justification? A year before I was born, it was illegal. It became illegal in this country to discriminate on the basis of race. And yet... The intensification of people like the BLM movement, which is, by the way, coordinating its efforts with Red China, this just came out, um, have, have gone up. Why? Why are we worried more about racism 57 years after it was outlawed in the United States? Because the, the, the goalposts have changed. I think it's totally reasonable to outlaw racism. And if you're guilty of hiring practices that are racist or promotion practices that are racist or admissions practices that are racist, you should be thrown in jail. If you're guilty of it, I believe that. But I do not believe in the government reaching out its compulsive hand and, uh, and saying you all must have the same proportion of different racial and other groups in every job that exists in the population. That's not freedom. That's communism. That is equality of result. And it's being touted now as equity. <laughs> and equity fundamentally judges people on the basis of birth characteristics, like their race. It is racist. It is a Jim Crow for the 21st century. And it's, it, is, it is a betrayal of everything the civil rights movement stood for. So why are people who call themselves civil rights leaders doing it? Because in a world where civil rights laws have succeeded and where the achievements that everyone in the 60s was going for have been realized, there's no need for new civil rights leaders. There's no need for organizations that pay their leaders very cushy salaries and give them opportunities to speak and rant and complain and give professorships to professors of this or that studies. There is no need for civil rights leaders in a post in a colorblind society. So there's some motive. In any event, I'm moving on. You get one more statement if you want it, because I'd rather give you the last word than have it myself. All right. So um, the more laws there are, the more criminals there are. That's just how it is, especially when the law is very vague. And you can extrapolate, um, extrapolate those laws that were put in place based on race to uh, use them as a leverage, I guess, to get whatever you want. And that's not good. But there very well might need to be amendments on that, because there needs to be an extent. How you would word that, I don't know, but... Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <sighs> Once we achieve from C to science shining C, C status, uh, we start moving out into the world. Uh, in the early 1890s, we look towards the Pacific, where we have a lot of trade and a lot of uh, commercial activity. 
And the recently, relatively recently discovered Hawaiian islands beckon. Now, Hawaii um, was not discovered during the Age of Discovery. It was discovered about 200 years later um, because of the way the trade winds work. The Spaniards and others who crossed the Pacific consistently went north or south of the Hawaiian Islands to such a degree they didn't even suspect they existed. But eventually, Hawaii is discovered. And around the time of Napoleon, the Hawaiian Napoleon, King Kamehameha, <coughs> unified the islands by force. Uh, Kamehameha is a <coughs> man whose armies were armed with spears and who traveled between the islands in dugout canoes. Um, but the idea of unifying the islands occurred when outsiders were encountered. The British called the area the Sandwich Islands. But they don't colonize them. The Hawaiians have a unified kingdom. Now, the British and the Americans do deals with the Hawaiian kingdom. In the 1890s, the Hawaiian queen, the ruling queen, is Leilu Kalani. Leilu Kalani has a beautiful sandstone palace built, which is now the governor's uh, mansion in Hawaii. And, well, if you ever watched an old TV show called Hawaii Five-O, the police uh, were based there. I don't know if the new Hawaii Five-O uses the same building or not. But the building is still there. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. American plantation owners began buying up a lot of the sugar plantations and other plantations that exist in Hawaii. Now, Hawaii has some of the most fertile farm soil on Earth. Why? Because Hawaii are a series of volcanic islands. Basically, a hot spot burned its way through the Earth's crust again and again and again, and that has produced a series of islands stretching from Midway uh, all the way to the big island of Hawaii that exists today, which is still erupting from time to time. Volcanic soil is even more fertile than river muck soil in places like Egypt or Mesopotamia. But the intensification of global conflict, or potential global conflict and trade in the 1890s brings the Europeans and the Americans to the conclusion that an independent kingdom like Hawaii just invites, say, German attack. The Germans are doing a lot of expanding in the Pacific. So the American planters arrange a coup. The queen, Lila Kalani, is, is, is deposed and uh, Hawaii becomes a territory of the United States. And in 1959, it becomes a state of the United States. Um, Hawaii becomes a commercial outpost for the United States, and ultimately the naval base at Pearl Harbor is gonna become our primary base of operations for naval operations in the Pacific Ocean. This happens before the Great Expansion of the Spanish-American War. Now, are there reactions against this? Well, yeah. First off, uh, the Japanese uh, started World War II by raiding the American Navy base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on Oahu. Uh, had the Japanese followed that up with a quick invasion force, they may very well have taken the Hawaiian Islands from us, which would have been bad. Um, as it is after the war, major Japanese interests have bought up massive amounts of land to the point now where there are native Hawaiians, there are Japanese who have massive influence in Hawaii, and then there are Americans. Yes? Was there any conflict with like Hawaiian natives when there was the coup against the Queen? There was some. Uh, there were some Hawaiian natives that didn't want this at all, mm -hmm. and they usually were killed. Um, the coup was bloody, but not it didn't go on and on. It was basically a change of government. And at that time, there was no way that the native Hawaiians could face uh, the forces that the United States brought in. Yeah. Yes. Did they just kind of like dethrone the queen or was it like an assassination? She was deposed and I think she went into exile. And I think she spent the rest of her life bad-mouthing the country that had deposed her. And I can't blame her. Um, However, even though the Japanese are the second most uh, powerful ethnic group within the Hawaiian Islands, uh, there is still some long-term resentment. School children in Hawaii know that if you're not native Hawaiian, 
Uh, you'd better watch yourself on your way home from school from the last day of school of the year because it's open season on anyone who's not Native Hawaiian. And it is a custom and a tradition that the white kids and the black kids and maybe the Japanese kids, I'm not sure about whether they're included in the target groups, but certainly any mainland American kids who are growing up and are going to these schools are chased by Native Hawaiians and they have the stuffing beaten out of them. Uh, ask anyone who's ever gone to school there. There's also a lot of under the, under uh, undercurrents uh, of anti-American sentiment that, that come out. Um, it's just it's part of life in Hawaii. It's a reason why if I ever do vacationing in the Pacific, I'll probably go elsewhere, just because I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with resentment on the part of people who I'm visiting or giving money to. But um, have any of you ever lived in Hawaii? Okay. Visited. Uh, what? I said visited. But not like yeah. Hawaii. Did you see any of this or no? Um, no, I we just really we went to Kauai, so it wasn't like mainland or anything. But yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I I've heard it's beautiful. I have, a, I have friends who visited there. Mr. Gabrielson used to love going there. I think he still does. Um. Okay. In 1898. The American second-class battleship USS Maine is in Cuba. It's in Cuba because the Cubans have been rebelling against the Spaniards. Cuba is one of the few remaining Spanish colonies in the Americas. American newspapers have gotten involved. The Spanish governor, uh, Senor Weiler, has been given a nickname, Butcher Weiler, by the William Randolph Hearst newspapers. And... Um, the main is there to make sure that the Spaniards don't get too harsh with the Cuban uh, nationalist uh, guerrillas. In early 1898, boom! The main explodes. <laughs> now, President McKinley sends an investigative team to Havana to see what the heck happened. But the Hearst newspapers immediately start printing that the Spaniards planted a mine on the hull of the main and blew it up, sending a message to the United States to back the heck off because Cuba is Spanish. This creates such rage in the American people long before the investigative team is able to do its job. They give a preliminary report and President McKinley says that he spent the entire night after receiving the report on his knees in prayer before God. And the next day he goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war against Spain. Um, the Congress approves. Remember, the main is the slogan. And American troops begin massing in Florida to take the, uh, to take the island of Cuba. The islands of Puerto Rico in the Caribbean near Cuba, of Guam in the Western Pacific, and the Philippines are also targets. Now, McKinley's assistant secretary of the Navy is New York politician Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt is a disciple of Alfred Thayer Mahan and his influence of sea power upon history. When the naval secretary is on vacation, Roosevelt orders the U.S. China Squadron to prepare for war, and if there is any even hint of war, the U.S. Pacific Squadron is to steam from Hong Kong to Manila Bay, the capital of the Philippines, destroy the Spanish fleet there, and prepare to receive American Marines. We're also the, they're also to begin negotiations with Filipino guerrillas who were fighting the Spanish. So when war is declared, pretty much everyone except Roosevelt and Commodore Dewey, the commander of that squadron, is shocked at how quickly the American warships steam out of Hong Kong, ready for war, in and, and arrive at Manila just a few days later. Early in the morning, they steam into Manila Bay and demolish the Spanish uh, battle squadron that's there. Um, having achieved naval dominance, they begin waiting for the arrival of American Marines and troops, and they begin negotiating with Emilio Aguinaldo, the head of the Filipino resistance. Meanwhile, um, 
American troops arrive uh, in sufficient numbers in Florida to cross the Florida Strait. But instead of landing in Havana, they go around Cuba to the southern region of Santiago de Cuba, which is the main Spanish naval base. They land forces of the U.S. Army. Now, our army is still uh, largely equipped with Civil War uniforms, which are wool. Imagine wearing wool in the tropical summer heat of Cuba. So there are many shots of American soldiers wearing nothing but their boots and their hats, ordering ships to land here and there and doing work utterly buck naked because their uniforms are simply too hot to work in. Um, half the army that arrives there are U.S. volunteer units. One volunteer unit is led by Theodore Roosevelt, who resigned from the Navy soon after the Battle of Manila Bay and helped co-found the Rough Riders, a cavalry unit that's half composed of wealthy Easterners and half composed of Western cowboys. These guys take part in the Battle of San Juan Hill, to capture the heights overlooking Santiago de Cuba. Because if you could care, capture those heights, you can put artillery on them and the Spanish fleet will be defeated and will win the war. When we take the heights, when Teddy Roosevelt charges up San Juan Hill successfully and takes the heights, um, the Spanish fleet flees. The American fleet that had been bottling the Spanish fleet up pursues and in detail sinks the Spanish fleet and the United States wins the war. Cuba's going to be an independent country. We fought the war for Cuban independence. So Cuba is not going to be made into an American colony. But the island of Puerto Rico will be. The island of Guam in the Pacific, in the Marianas Islands, will also become an American colony. The Spanish ruled it. The Chamorros live there. The Americans take it over. As to the Philippines, I think I told you the story, but I will remind you of it. We make a deal with Aguinaldo. We'll work together against the Spaniards, and once the Spaniards are gone, Aguinaldo will be the leader of a new independent Philippine Republic. However, as the Spaniards are defeated, and as we are getting ready to leave, the German Pacific Squadron shows up in Manila Bay with a bunch of troop ships. And they are clearly waiting for the Americans to leave so that Germany can claim the Philippines. Remember how land-hungry Germany is at this point. So that Germany can claim the Philippines land troops. So we are faced with a choice. Do we honor our word to Aguinaldo? Leave and let the Germans take the Philippines? Because there's no way Aguinaldo can, can defeat the German army not at the height of its power. Or do we wait, break our word with Aguinaldo, keep the Philippines as an American colony, and try to bring the Filipinos to a point where they can become independent in this very dangerous modern world? Kipling writes his poem, The White Man's Burden, which is an encouragement to the United States to take the Philippines and to try to sav uh, civilize the savage Filipinos. Which is an interesting idea, considering that the Filipinos have been Christian for two or three hundred years. The Spaniards have been there for two or three hundred years. And of all the Asian peoples, the most westernized are the Filipinos. But they're not modern. Ultimately, we decide to stick it to the Germans and to Aguinaldo, and we take the Philippines. This begins the bloody part of the war. The Spanish-American War ends. It's a splendid little war. It's a war that we win a lot of territory with relatively few casualties. Uh, the Spaniards are humiliated. We're now a world power. Our Navy gets a lot more money, and all of that is good. However, in the Philippine Islands, from 1899, when we betray Aguinaldo, for the next 10 years or so, there is heavy fighting. Lots of Americans get killed. Lots of American soldiers and Marines and civilians. The fighting ultimately is driven to the southern island of Mindanao, the Islamic island in the Philippine archipelago. And there, what looks like we have a chance to win. A young American army officer named John J. Blackjack Pershing is put in command of a unit hunting Filipino guerrillas, uh, the Moros, they're called. 
They capture a group of Moros that were the uh, leaders of terrorism in a particular region of Mindanao. Pershing decides, enough of this. We're not playing by nice rules anymore. He orders a pig to be brought in. Big, fat pig. He has the men tied to stakes. He then slaughter, has his soldiers slaughter the pig most bloodily in front of them, splattering them with the pig guts and the pig blood. He then orders his men to dip their bullets in the pig blood and load their weapons in a firing squad. He kills all but one. That one is allowed to go free. The Philippine resistance ends that day. Don't tell me there it's impossible to win a guerrilla war. You just need to be brutal as hell. Why did that work? Well, the Filipino resistance in that area was Islamic. Muslims do not like pigs, do not like pork. And the belief of the Moros was that if they are killed and pig blood is involved, they're going to hell. They don't get the virgins. They don't go to paradise. They are tainted by the pig blood and they will go to hell. So the American army under Pershing proves that we are not only going to kill them in this life, but we're going to damn them in the next. Their spirit is broken and the Philippine War is finally won around 1908-1909. Uh, we become a colonial power. And uh, actually, we do something that most of the colonial powers don't do. We work very hard to try to build up a Filipino middle class that's educated so that we hope by 1940 the Philippines can become a fully independent country. In the 1930s, the Philippines were a semi independent country. So we're a world power. Next time, Le Belle et Pop. I do. Garrett, thanks again for your conversation.